Hello, and welcome to The Analyst Angle. I'm Rob Strecce, lead analyst for The Collective from Silicon Angle and The Cube. This is a new segment where we're going to talk about research we're doing, bringing up interesting things, really breaking the signal out from the noise of all the marketing and hype that's out there, and really bringing you those insights, not only on our research, but research from some of our friends and part of The Collective. Today, we're going to delve into the fascinating world of data platforms and the brewing battle for dominance in that space. The rise of data platforms was inevitable. Given its massive total addressable market, it's estimated to be in the tens of billions of dollars. It's no surprise that every vendor with a data-related offering is vying for a piece of this lucrative market. But how comparable are these different approaches? Today, we're gonna to break that down, take the signal out of the noise, and explore just what that is to be a data platform. But before we dive into the details, let's define what we mean by a data platform. To us, a data platform provides the ability to programmatically use data through SQL queries, programmatic APIs like RESTful APIs, has built-in virtualization tools because you want to be able to see the data after you put it where it is, the ability to programmatically ETL or ELT, extract, transform, and load that data to and from the data warehouse, data lake, programmatic object storage, all of that, and or access data protocols such as ODBC or JDBC need to be in place. So you need to be able to use the data once you get it to where it is. Essentially, a data platform is a comprehensive solution that not only stores data, but also offers APIs for data ingestion, methods for data processing, addresses data governance, that's a really important one, especially now, and ensures scalability and performance because you want to use it at cloud scale, no matter where you are. It can be delivered as build your own platform or as a service. And we're going to kind of break that down a little bit further as we go through today as well. Let's discuss the market for a second. For this, I got with fellow analyst Dave Vellante to really dig into and examine the data that we get from our partner, ETR. We were intrigued by one question that could lead us to know how mature is this market? Was it done? Was it already won? How were different approaches really coming at this market? And what was kind of the state of affairs today within the survey base that ETR uses? The thesis was that although there are some large vendors in, commercial, in the commercial data platform space, such as Snowflake and Databricks, there is a ton of room still in this market. In fact, we talked about this in a breaking analysis much recently around how much room was there. And that the fact is that really it didn't look like there was any dominant player just yet. We wanted to take a next level down and start to examine how much room really is there in this and where can we understand it. So let's uh, take a look at the slide from ETR. And what we looked at here was underneath the hood, we put in every storage vendor that we could think of. And we then overlaid on top of that the most common data platforms. Why did we do this? We wanted to understand the pervasiveness of storage vendors such as Dell EMC, NetApp, Vast, Pure, HPE, and IBM, and others within accounts. So that became the base number of N, as you could call it. Then, on top of that, we wanted to slice and dice how often do people like Databricks did people like Snowflake, or AWS, or Google, or Microsoft, or Oracle, HPE with their uh, Esmeral product and Couchbase, 
how often did they pop up? We actually had a number of others that didn't even rate within these accounts. And you can see the N is, you know, in the 400, the high 400s, 480 plus. So that's a pretty good N to be directionally accurate in where things stand. So underneath the hood is, again, the baseline is what storage vendors they're using. And overlaid on top of that is momentum within those accounts for those doing ML, AI, and databases, data warehouses, data lakes on top of that storage or in the cloud. And what you get to see is, not surprisingly, Microsoft has a significant uh, lead from a perspective of awareness and mentions inside of these counts being up in the 70% range. When you start to break that down further and you look at AWS and Google, they're you know, about in the middle uh, for AWS and about a little bit to the 30% mark with Google. I think what was fascinating is the height at which they are. The, all three of those are above the 40% line along with Snowflake and Databricks. That shows the momentum. The height is the momentum within those accounts, how often or how much uh, market share, you could almost say, are they gaining within these accounts. So you can see that Couchbase is about 5% plus, and you have Esmeral is actually at, uh, HPE's Esmeral, at a minus 10%. Well, what that means for those is they're not growing as fast within these organizations. So really just breaking that down, this gives us a kind of idea of where are people really looking and how much room is there. The fact that Snowflake and Databricks are growing so fast, faster than their cloud competitors, what's really interesting is that they're not pervasive within those accounts yet. So when we start to look at it from a headroom or how much total addressable market or TAM do they still have left to go after, there's a significant amount of TAM left there. And I think this is really why we thought this was going to be a very interesting way to look at this because it helps to understand why things are going the way they're going and why there's so much buzz about Databricks and Snowflake, whereas there are other competitors in this market, and maybe we haven't even just seen all of the ones that are starting to compete for this. So let's now dig in and come back to talking about what is going on with the characteristics of each of these and identify as the types of data platforms. Note, these different types of data platforms are not mutually exclusive. Many companies will have more than one, and some of these live in multiple different categories. So there will be some overlap when we start to look at this. Uh, I, you know, we took a pretty simplistic approach to this. I would call it a SWOT analysis approach, which is really looking at the strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats within each of these types of data platform categories. And then we drop the threat uh, because it really that's used more for when you're analyzing specific uh, companies and vendors within that. So we took a SWO approach, I guess you could call it. Uh, so we're swowing through this because definitely it solves use cases for building data products with all of the approaches to data platforms with some caveats. And we'll kind of explore those caveats as we go along. So what we're gonna do is kind of jump in here and let's start to examine commercial independent as a service, data warehouses, data lakes, and data mesh as a group of vendors. These platforms such as Databricks, Snowflake, Starburst, Couchbase, and others really constitute these vendors. First thing we're going to look at is their strengths. They provide several ways to access data programmatically. Again, when we go back to the definition, that's really important. How I'm going to actually use the data is super important. How I can get access, how I'm going to engineer. So 
several different ways. They have data lakes, they have data warehouses, SQL, Python, a number of different ways, REST or RESTful APIs as well. Then they have normalized and programmatic ways of ingesting data. So if you can't get the data into your data platform, if you can't build pipelines on top, then it becomes really hard to actually use that data platform. These folks in this category really do a good job and have a really robust ecosystem, not just their own ways of ingesting the data by sitting underneath applications, but they have other partner ecosystems that supply the data pipelines as well. They also have catalog and data mapping features for governance. As I kind of highlighted, data governance is more important than ever in these platforms, understanding your lineage, understanding where did the data come from. In a future discussion, we'll get into why that's super important. Not gonna go super deep into it, but to kind of just understand that people are building data products on top of these data platforms is huge. They really are building out the next gen of data apps with that data product. We'll dig into that again in a future analyst angle. They have built-in storage platforms for the most part. Usually object or file can be completely abstracted. Some actually abstract it fully, some give you choices. Some allow you to go on to object storage in a cloud. Some require you to have some object storage and some more block-based storage. Different architectures, different cost profiles, and we'll kind of delve into that a little bit as well. All of them are cloud scale and have performance. So this is a huge advantage for them. They're out there being able to be deployed widely that really helps them from a perspective as they get deployed and as they scale, you're not reinventing how your data platform has to be scaled out. This is super important. They do scale differently, so your mileage will vary depending on which data platform you're using. A lot of them have been built out off of open source components and use those for their scaling capabilities as well. Now let's take a second and dive into the weaknesses for those data lakes, data warehouses, and data mesh platforms. Understanding or comparing the cost of the service can be complicated, especially bring your own storage. And what we mean here is that it's not necessarily all that easy to understand why is it costing you a certain way when maybe you used to do something on premise and you're trying to compare apples and oranges between the two, an on-prem data platform service and a cloud-based data platform service, a lot of that gets abstracted and is complicated. Once you start to bring in, bring your own storage, then you have to do some pretty significant math to understand how this is all pieced together. That can complicate things as well, but it can also lead to cost savings. Options to run in co-location facilities such as Equinix or Sovereign Cloud and or on-premise data centers may not be an option or it may be a very limited version of the product. This is another really huge weakness today. Although some of these as a service based models are bringing them to Colos through partnering with some of the people that are in the storage data product layer that we'll talk about. This is, again, where things get to be a little bit uh, nuanced in the fact that there are ways to approach this. Are they cost effective or not? That also, your mileage will vary on that. So from there, we're gonna jump into opportunities. Again, the SWO methodology here. Doing as a service on premise, in co location, or sovereign clouds are solvable if the underlying platform is designed correctly. Uh, I feel very strongly, knowing a lot of these vendors in this category, that they can go and be in sovereign clouds. They can go and be in co location facilities. They have built usually on 
Kubernetes or containers and have pieces that they can go and do. It's just a cost to market attainment that they have to do with calculations. Are they going to bring their products to these co-location or on-premise or sovereign clouds? I think we'll start to see the sovereign clouds first. Based on the customers I'm talking to, there seems to be a great desire to go beyond the big three or big four companies that they're partnered with. So let's take a step back now. And next, let's explore the capabilities of the hyperscaler clouds in the data platform space. Again, you know these companies, companies like Amazon Web Services, Google, and Oracle offer extensive sets of services that can rival independent as a service data platform vendors. In fact, many of them partner with those vendors as well and run their data platforms in their clouds some offering them as actually first party vendors. In the case of something like a Databricks and Azure, it's actually run by Azure. So let's start out with the strengths. A broad breadth of services can cover data warehousing, data lakes, and data mesh, including first party services like I just mentioned from some of the independents. I think We've all been up and seen the 380 plus services in an AWS and figuring out which data platform service, because there's at least seven or eight databases that you could go and use, which one is the right approach for you becomes a very complicated, but they do have them all. They have the vector databases. They have a number of different data lake and data warehousing. They have Hadoop. They have a number of these. They have Spark. They have all of these different pieces for you. So again, the hyperscalers have a completely broad group of these data platforms, at least at the data warehouse and data mesh. Some of the service offerings that go beyond what some of the independent offer as well, and comes with capabilities built in AI ML capabilities. I think you're starting to see that and some of the announcements that were made at Snowflake and Databricks Summit, they're bringing the AI ML capabilities as well. But the hyperscalers do have a little bit of an advantage where it's their ecosystem and they've been there working on this a long time. AI and ML is not a new thing for these different hyperscaler providers. They've been in this market for quite some time. I think where they're working really hard is and what things have changed from a prompt engineering perspective is how do I get over the skill set gap that my customers have and have these soft service offerings that are easy to use. They're really working on that and they do have the capabilities. Another piece that they have that's an advantage is they have a low initial pricing and enterprise contracts in place with many of the companies or many of you out there already have these enterprise pricing agreements and you have to use a certain amount of their services per year. So this is, makes it very easy for experimentation. And this is why you start to see some of the momentum gaining within the hyperscalers when we showed the ETR data earlier. It's really interesting to see how that continues to gain as new services, as things are launched that make it easier for them to be used. They also have an abstract, a built-in storage platform layer that is usually object or file, can be completely abstracted, or you can bring your own type of storage platform from one of their other services. So depending on if you're looking to build your complete data platform yourself, or if you're looking to take on one of their data platforms as is, you have these different ways of trying to optimize your costs. But I will say, it can become complex very quickly. Obviously, one of their advantages is cloud scale and performance as well. They, that's where it comes from, the cloud, right? I mean, this is motherhood and apple pie from that perspective when you start to look at it. They also have a choice of services that solve the problem. Uh, most you know, clouds, as I was saying, offer a variety of different services that can be used and address different use cases. And I think that becomes 
really one of their, their selling points is not only do they have their, their own first party services, they have second party services like Snowflake and Databricks for first party services by those companies. So it becomes a really good way for you to be able to get into a different uh, set of tooling that can help you move very quickly. Let's dive into the weaknesses. I, I think what I've been just hitting on, the choice of services to solve the problem with overlap between services, in many cases, a service doesn't equal a solution, leaving the customer to integrate different pieces or different smaller services together to really attain their data platform. Right now, this is probably the biggest deterrent is, do I have the people, do I have the knowledge internally to go and architect my data platform, do I take one of the raw ones there that may cost me more today initially, but has legs to solve that problem in that use case? This is, a when I talk to customers, this is really one of the big points that they're starting to look on is that when they are building out their data services, maybe they have to use a particular file system or a particular uh, set of storage or object, or maybe it's some compute that has some cost implications based on how they are solving their use case. That is true. Not every service fits every use case the same, and really it will vary pretty significantly. It also only runs on their cloud. I think this is one of the big weaknesses of using the hyperscaler uh, types of data platforms is if you go with their native platform, you're really locked into their native platform. And getting out of that native platform can be really cumbersome, especially how you migrate all of your data start to get to a petabyte or something like that of data in your data platform, it really can be tough for them to move. Uh, this also, as I was kind of bringing up earlier, is you know really less that they have some agreements in some of, some of the bigger hyperscalers have agreements with sovereign clouds to run particular clouds in certain geo, geographic areas such as Europe or China, but you're really forced into their on-premise solution if you want to bring things or part of your data on-premise or into a co-location, meaning that you're looking at something like an AWS outpost, which may or may not have the services offered for everything you want to do, or you may have the data left on-premise and have high networking costs going back to a region to use that service. This is the same across all of these different hyperscalers. It's not unique to AWS, Azure, Google, all have these. OCI or Oracle has a little bit different approach with how they do their on-premise. We'll dive into that another day, but again, when you start to look at these services, what gets run there, sometimes it's significantly limited to what you can run on-premise. Availability of those services in a particular region can even be a challenge, and sometimes in countries. And that happens to be with the different rollouts, or maybe you're limited by the number of GPUs you can find in a particular region as well. This can be really tough, and especially if there's potential regulations around your data or a governance model that forces you to be in a certain region where the service is not offered. So it's not necessarily a zero-sum game by going to the hyperscalers and saying, I can use their service everywhere. Your mileage will vary, by service, by service provider or hyperscaler. Now, it's not all doom and gloom for the hyperscalers by any stretch of the imagination. They have a lot of customers, as we saw in the ETR data, with Amazon and Microsoft really being having significant momentum along with Google, who's at a much letter, less amount of actual usage today. But by partnering with most, if not all, independent data platforms, hyperscaler clouds gain direct or indirect revenue from use of compute network and storage. So this opportunity is that if they have an all of the above strategy, which some of them do, I'm going to put all of those independent ones on there, all those independent data platforms onto my hyperscale cloud, 
because at the end of the day, I'm looking for consumption of network, of compute, and of storage. So it's not a zero-sum game. And competition is healthy for them, which is why you see them supporting them and working with them so much now. May have been a different story, you know, six, seven years ago when Snowflake was just becoming what they are today. Today, they're embracing that. Hyperscale clouds also understand that customers are, not, are looking for solutions, not services, and can do better, if not slower, job to build those customer requirements into their services. And what I mean here is that I have to still, a lot of times, piecemeal all of the different pieces or you know, three or four different services together to get my pipelines and everything else, my database, get all my data lake, all of these different things set up within a hyperscaler. This is a place where I think they'll quickly make and seize on this opportunity. It's a customer experience or CX involvement in making it easier to get to your initial data platform that can rival some of those independent commercial data platforms. Now that we're done with the hyperscalers, let me take a second and dive into the ones who traditionally owned the data. And these are the data storage platform vendors. I think, again, we all know who they are. They've been in the data centers for years and years. There's hundreds of billions of dollars in this space still to this day. Moving on and let's consider what are these data storage platform vendors doing today? These vendors traditionally focused on on-prem data centers or co-location facilities, and still to a major part do. They've expanded their offerings also to include hyperscale clouds as a service. Some of them have actually done pretty well moving their file systems or what have you up there. So some of the examples of these vendors are HPE Storage with Esmerel, Pure Storage with Portworx Data Services, Vast Data Services products, Dell Storage as part of their Apex, Hitachi Vitara Storage with Pentaho Software, and there's many others, including IBM, who has a net of software that runs on their storage as well or in their cloud. But there's a reason why they have still have significant strength in this market. And this market is not one as we saw. They still have a lot of headroom and are in a lot of this market that people like Databricks, that people like Snowflake are not in, or Couchbase for that matter. They started with the storage platform development and they have a history of building economical storage offerings. What does that mean? They've built the storage, the flash, the object, the file, the spinning disk, mostly moving towards uh, flash type, all flash type arrays that can be very economically priced as a service with software on top. Again, Another strength is that they offer OpEx or CapEx options for platform acquisition. In the type of market we're in today where, you know, IT budgets may not be growing as much as they could be in a future years or in the out years, CapEx may be attractive to some of these. Maybe I don't want to rent all the petabytes of data all the time, every month, month over month. So how you acquire this could be not just OpEx, but CapEx, and that gives them a significant advantage over some of the hyperscalers as well as those commercial data platform offerings. Because most of those are ARR, or annual recurring revenue generated, so I go in with a subscription. Whereas the still, a significant amount of storage data platforms are sold as CapEx today. Most offer all types of storage, object, file, block, all in a single scalable platform. These object offerings provide programmatic, usually S3 API or RESTful API access to that data. So there are different programmatic ways to get at the data in its raw state. Often the storage offerings can be prepackaged with or in a compute platform. 
with an oper a cloud operating environment. So what does that mean? Usually these are referred to as hyper-converged or converged systems and include virtual machines or a Kubernetes layer on top that can get you up and running really quickly. So maybe then I have you know, a services vending machine that can pull down known good. Again, we can get into software supply chains and who has better known good software to go and do things like Spark or what have you on top of it. So again, they get you up and running very quickly on-prem or in your colo once the hardware arrives. And customers can deploy pretty much anywhere. I think this is a huge advantage, even in some cases in the hyperscale cloud. So maybe I want to have part of my environment up there and they have a way for me to move data in between on-prem, colo, and hyperscale cloud. But the strength comes in the you know, as a service models with co-location and MSP partners. This gives them more regional support and gives them breadth. They've been selling servers to you forever. They all understand what you're doing, how you're doing it. Now, some of the language that they're using is very different nowadays, but again, they're able to come to you with these as a service models and partners that are co-location or MSPs or managed service providers that can actually help you with that skills gap that you may be experiencing. It's a huge advantage having that partner network. The hyperscalers, to a lesser extent, do have partner networks such as that, but where they do compete in the hosting aspect of it really brings them down a little bit. So that's the sunny side of it. Now let's go into the weaknesses and start to look at what, what are the catches here? Most do not have data warehouse, data lake, or data mesh environments installed out of the box in their storage systems, leaving it up to the customer to figure out or buy yet another product from that company to overlay on top of their storage foundation. So this, again, becomes a, I need to build it myself, but at a very different level. And this is also changing, however. I, I think that that's the exciting part. What we're starting to see is this market, they realize it, they're not dumb. They see how the data platforms, they see how the clouds are bringing simplicity, customer experience, and they understand that they want to get there. An example is HPE Esmeral leverages open source and data mesh technology such as Presto. Pure Portworks, provides an open source catalog and pipelines on top of pure storage. And IBM has a number of technologies across the spaces, some of which have come from the formally, being formally in the Red Hat side of the business. This is a space you should be watching. I, this is gonna be quickly evolving, and if I had to put a pin in anything here, this is the space that I really would be watching because I think you're going to start to see a lot of blurring of the lines between storage and data platforms over the coming months here. Uh, and I definitely think into the back half of the year, you're go these are going to be compelling offerings that you may want to take a look at in addition to what you're doing with people like Snowflake and Databricks. Another weakness is most platforms do not run in the hyperscale cloud. Those that do are just storage platforms for the most place, or they're an overlay over the storage in that hyperscale or cloud. At that point in time, it really varies if you're going to go with one of these data platforms that's been built and can do on-premise or colo, or are you gonna just go with the hyperscaler services or one of those first party uh, data services from the commercial data warehouse, data lake, data mesh providers who make it very simple inside of those uh, hyperscalers. I think this is gonna be one of the key battlegrounds is what ends up in the hyperscale cloud? Can these platforms bridge that gap? Because again, it's a big piece for them to go and provide. And it's being that kind of pervasive layer. It's the same challenge that the hyperscalers have being only in their own cloud, maybe in their on-prem uh, type of outpost thing, but it's, it's definitely a weakness that 
we'll see how they overcome it. But they're definitely aiming at that. Data ingest is up to the customer. All, all of the storage platforms uh, focus on more of the actual at rest data versus getting the data in there. That's where these add-ons such as Esmeral or Portworks uh, come in. And you'll start to see others that are doing a really good job. I can't go into it, but really under the hood, you'll start to see it becoming more and more integrated with those storage platforms because they understand that it's not just about where does the data sit, the type of data or type of uh, access, you know, object, file, or block. It's really about how you make the data usable. So that kind of brings us to the opportunities that these storage platform vendors and data platform vendors have. And it's by adding these data platforms, pre-integrating as a service into the storage platform vendors, this will be a way for them to address the caller, what I would call the cost and value conundrums that data engineers and CIOs face today. You know, it's, hey, I keep putting things into Amazon, it's all hot data, and I still have these costs that keep on occurring. I don't get to tier them off to, you know, a lower tier of S3 and be able to use Glacier, for instance, because the data is so used so often and I'm not sure how it's gonna be used. This is really a conundrum for the hyperscalers and is a place and an opportunity for these storage data platforms to really come in and be able to show the value because this is where they've built their current customer base. I think also regulations will force data platforms into co-location sovereign clouds and regional cloud providers because it's just those regulations are coming. I mean, we had some stuff around Safe Harbor out of the EU just last week, which really will probably get shot down in the European courts because it doesn't go far enough. You're going to see eventually some US-based regulations that are going to force this to map to the GDPR type regulations for all of Europe. You still have CCPA in California and VCDPA in Virginia. Those are kind of, you know, the canaries in the coal mine that are really showing you that there needs to be a data mapping between us and GDPR. It's gonna come at the governmental layer of the US. I would also say that one of the places they do play very well and it's an opportunity for them to sell is no egress or ingress fees on the data movement can give them an incredible cost advantage. The networking aspect of it, most of these companies partner with and or are working with or have their own first party networking solutions in this space. So again, I think this is a place where the networking could give them a huge opportunity and a huge win from a cost perspective. Lastly, we're going to explore open source data platforms. These are solutions predominantly available through their supporting commercial entities. Again, Databricks has Delta Lake and uh, Apache Spark under the hood, but again, you start to see them, you can still download them as open source platforms as well at their source. They provide many ways for data access programmatically similar to commercial data platforms. Uh, examples include what I was talking about. Many of the commercial products uh, are built on top of these types of offerings or open source offerings like Apache Spark, Delta Lake, Presto, Trino, and many more. Those are kind of the building blocks. You still have to take a Lego approach to this and connect the right pieces together. I mean, the strengths, you know, they provide several ways of accessing the data programmatically. You can choose based on which platform your organization deploys. Uh, so this is huge. Depending on what your skill set is in your organization, they can solve, they can be more SQL oriented, they can be more Python oriented. If you're looking to use Jupyter Notebooks on top of it, they have ways to plug in.
But again, you've got to build towards your end use case and goal. Are you doing really data engineering? Are you doing data science? Who is the end persona that is actually using the product and the output, that data product that is coming out of that platform? Like the commercial data platforms, open source has normalized and pro programmatic ways to ingest data as well. Most of them are built in. You also have different pipelines or ways of going about this. You have things such as RabbitMQ for moving things around. It, it, there's a lot of different ways for you to look at the pipelines and how you really move the data around uh, between where it's discovered or ingested and in your data lakes. They're cloud scale and the performance is there. Uh, these, are, these have been engineered for hyperscale cloud benefit. So you're really going to be able to get that right out of the box without having to worry. Most of them have thought through how do you scale on instances, how do you scale across that storage layer behind the data platform. And I'll say that the initial cost of the software can be minimal to zero for the data platform. Where you do get hit is in the actual experience and the people and the skill sets that you have to have there. So this, this one, although I put it here, uh, is also in the weakness category, as you'll see as well. So let's jump into it, into the weaknesses. When building from an open source component perspective, all the system integration work is on the end user. Again, it's that Lego approach. You're going to have to have the people. That becomes pretty hard. An organization, another kind of weakness is an organization needs to question, is this core to their business or is it a science project? As the costs of doing pure open source can look attractive initially, but quickly escalate. And this is in people, this is in resources. You have to understand how to run these because again, if you're running them in open, in a, a hyperscale cloud, for instance, you download some open source, you start to run it. Those instance costs, or if you're using functions or lambdas, they can spiral pretty quickly. Plus you have to look at your networking expense as well, because where is the data? How do I move the data? Where do I acquire the data? It has to be engineered into your platform as you build it. Catalog and data, data mapping features for governance will not be built in from the start. This is and can lead to a data platform silo or worse, overly permissive data access, leaving the organization exposed. So what am I saying here is that uh, you're not going to have the bells and features of governance that a Snowflake or a Databricks or one of the other storage vendors is putting in out of the box. Uh, and you're going to have to layer on some open source or some other components to really handle that or maybe use some hyperscaler services to deal with your governance of that data. That's a huge problem. And I think that most organizations look at it as being way too complex. Or maybe if it's core to their business, it becomes a data silo and they're able to manage it that way and justify the cost. That could be, hey, tech is my thing or I'm an online uh, e-tailer and I build a certain portion of it out of open source data platform because that is so core to what I do with recommendation engines or something like that built on top of those data platforms. And we'll get into that again in another session. But again, it, it, it can be very complex to go out and build it. I've been there, done that and seen it and have the scars to you know, really prove that Building your own SaaS can be very complicated. And building or buying your own storage platform means that you know, the complexity is really not completely abstracted. You still have to have people who know how to run these systems under the hood of the open source if you're bringing it on-prem, or you need to know how to operate that for the open source inside your hyperscaler. Again, not completely abstracted. You have to have that knowledge in-house. So it's not all doom and gloom for open source. Uh, I mean, when we look at opportunities for open source, open source is innovation. 
I'm very big and very bullish on the open source. And I do think it's a really good place to look for inspiration and experiment that can lead to really good outcomes. So maybe starting with a data platform that is open source and then looking for the commercial component from one of the storage vendors or one of the commercial open source vendors or even within those hyperscalers as well. I think that can give you a really great way to look at this. And I think actually contributing back into the open source community, if you have that luxury as an end user, can be really advantageous because you can see some of these people who are pushing the cutting edge with the open source because it is germane to their business and revenue generating. This can give you really great ideas on how to take the next step, how to decide is it a science project or is it really something that is going to be revenue generating. It'll be really something to be involved with and I, you know, they all have Slack channels. I highly recommend getting involved. And open source will be where the next generation of data platforms is invented and evolved. This is where everything has come from already. This is where it's going. Uh, this is why you have Apache Spark being kind of the underpinnings uh, originally of Databricks. You have Delta Lake, which is the data warehousing that has been open sourced. You have a number of these different, like Trino coming out of Presto, where they're going from a data mesh perspective is really evolving. So being involved, understanding this, at least tracking it is super important. And we track it here. And so you'll be able to see that on the analyst angle as well and come back here. We do a lot with open source and we are very bullish on where it's going. You know, open source versus closed source, open source is definitely one. So once we did our SWO, looking at strengths, weaknesses, and opportunities, uh, we had the opportunity to put them in a quadrant because really you're not an analyst without a quadrant. So here's our quadrant, really looking at where does everything stand from a perspective of, you know, how hard is it to integrate? So is it build your own on the axis, the middle axis here, uh, kind of the equator line? Are you going to build your own to all the way to packaged? Is it cloud native, on-prem, or in colo? I kind of wanted to simplify this down a little bit so that it can give you a perspective because, again, you may use multiple different data platforms because your use cases definitely tell you you should. Again, I don't think that any one data platform will win an entire organization. It's going to be very rare that that happens. But again, you have choices. You have choices in deployment, such as cloud. The hyperscaler clouds, again, they score poorly on being able to be hybrid because they are so wed to the services being in their hyperscaler cloud. Next to that, you have the commercial. Uh, they're kind of a little bit better. They've made some agreements. Uh, Snowflake uh, last year uh, at their conference had gone through and made an agreement with Dell uh, to be able to bring Snowflake to Dell and to the Dell Apex with some of their co-location providers. Again, do we see a lot of that in the market? Not yet, but again, it, you do have those options. So I think that the commercial folks are looking at this, commercial data platform folks are looking at this as, hey, we can go there. They also do do more packaging. Uh, in some cases, Snowflake, it's heavily integrated. Uh, with Databricks, it's a, a little bit more federated in how they approach this. Same with people like uh, those others that are out there like Starburst and others where it may be more federated and you're bringing other pieces to bear. So they kind of almost straddle the line a little bit between build your own and fully packaged. But for the pure data platform where you don't have to worry about the storage, it's pretty much taken care of for you. The infrastructure, the scaling, the virtual machines or the instances that are in the cloud, they score really highly on that. And that's why they've dropped towards the center. Then you have your storage data platforms. They're really heavily packaged, very well integrated from a storage perspective up. They're a little bit not as packaged when you get to 
uh, how they bring those data platform services such as Spark or Kafka or something else, where you go into and how you download it, they're getting better. And I think, again, I, I can't, I guess, say it enough. This is absolutely a place to watch as these folks move closer and closer towards the center and come towards where those commercial platforms are at, leveraging a significant amount of open source. And you'll see that most of those vendors are spending a good amount of money and a good number of engineers to support those open source packages such as Presto in the open source community so that they can see it thrive. Again, another way to look at that because although I've put open source far to the left and a little bit above the line from a uh, more used in cloud than they are on premise, I think it's you know those coming together with the storage data platforms is really a compelling aspect of it. And I think this will be interesting to see. It's a place to watch. I think doing pure, uh, you know, open source is really tough. And I think that's, you know, a key that you need to look at. So let's bring this home. Let me wrap this up with what's the angle here. And let's kind of talk about, it's about things you should consider when you're looking at data platforms. I didn't want to just throw out there a whole bunch of stats and what I'm seeing from all of the customers, but what am I also hearing about them when they're talking, when we talk to enterprises and they're trying to figure out how do I go and buy my data platform? It's where you can deploy your data platform will vary. Most organizations will have some on-prem, will have some colo, and will have some hyperscaler. You have to consider this when you're looking at this, trying to avoid those different silos. Costs will vary greatly depending on all of the components you bring to bear. So again, you can go with fully packaged, using everything from one vendor, may have a higher cost from a dollars perspective or OPEX or even potentially CAPEX perspective, but it may lower your costs from a people perspective, and it may help you get over skills gaps that you have. So again, trade-offs and costs will vary greatly between where you deploy, how you deploy, and how you actually maintain that from a go-forward perspective. Who bundles and runs the platform is a major choice. Again, this is kind of building off that skill set you really need to understand what's going on there and how things will vary. And a single platform versus build your own platform is gonna be a big piece of this as well. Building your own platform can have some cost advantages from a software perspective and an ARR and an OPEX, but it may have CapEx expects, uh, may have CapEx or OPEX requirements from people or gear that you need to then go and get. So this is not just about where it is, but it's how you bring it together as well. Choice of compute and storage will vary and will be either abstracted or not. And that becomes a skills gap perspective as well. If you already have a really good AWS group or Azure group or GCP or Oracle group to go and run these data platforms, you could see that being an advantage that you may know how to run it there effectively. But again, that's something that we'll see how that pans out and you'll tell me uh, how you're doing. And with this, I want to thank you for joining the analyst angle on the cube powered by ETR. And thank you for joining us on this exploration of the brewing data platform battle. Stay tuned for more analyst angles on the cube where the collective extracts the signal from the noise. Take care.